We've got four speakers uh, this afternoon, and I'm going to introduce them. But before I introduce them, I thought it might be helpful to introduce you as the audience to them. Uh, today is about, uh, this afternoon is about design thinking and end of life care. And I wondered if people would mind uh, putting up your hand if you heard uh, Charlie Ledbetter speak at the Help the Hospices conference in 2009. Keep your hand up. Did you hear him in 2010? <laughs> and have you read Dying for Change uh, that was done by Demos? Uh, lovely, lovely. Okay. Um, for me, uh, those two talks by Charlie and then uh, the publication by Demos called Dying for Change had two it, it, enormously challenging, uh, but some real opportunities in there as well. But the two challenges <coughs> that I have thought a lot about in my own practice and my leadership of St. Christopher's is this. One, he talked about um, intimacy at scale. And uh, the book remarks on how well hospices do, but how few people get access to the kind of services they need. And I have been very challenged by that. And you only have to look even at the data for this year, which is very uh, encouraging to see that many people don't get access to the kind of help that we can give them. But the second thing, which I think is even more important, was that Charlie and Jake talked about the kind of change that was needed to uh, make the difference that we could. And they called for disruptive transformational change, uh, change that were, came from the outside and uh, was about doing things completely differently. And one of their challenges to us is that a lot of our change is incremental and it's internally driven uh, at best. So we're going to hear from four people who are going to tell us how to do that kind of change differently and the kind of things that we might want to uh, think about as we do that. And we're going to start with Ivor Williams. He's a senior design associate at the Helix Centre and he's based at St Mary's Hospital in London. Barbara Gale, who uh, probably needs no introduction to many of you, uh, will follow. She is the chief executive of St. Nicholas Hospice in Bury St. Edmunds. Uh, she'll be followed by Sarah Gillinson. She's the chief executive of the Innovation Unit, and they've been doing a very interesting piece of work called Better Endings. And last but not least uh, is Bill Noble, who works at Marie Curie, and he's going to uh, bring the presentations to a close. So uh, let's get going. Welcome, Ivor. Hello. Um, yes, I am a designer from the, the Helix Center, so I'm going to talk um, for around 15 minutes about who we are, what we do, and the sort of projects that we've got around end-of-life care. Um, and I guess the question we're asking, especially with the work we do, is what can design do? And to kind of really kind of contextualize that, I'm going to go back a little bit to the 1850s. Um, <laughs> the Crimean War, uh, as you will probably be aware of, was this place and space where Florence Nightingale really kind of began her journey into transforming nursing. And um, what a lot of people don't know is how she used design to do that. Um, so, don't need to tell the story of the Crimean War, but the, the long and short of it was that more people were dying in the hospitals than they were in the battlefield. And what Florence uh, Nightingale did as a nurse and as a practitioner actually pioneered some incredible information design to communicate clearly and very simply to the British public, to the government and to the Queen, exactly how bad the problem was. Uh, and obviously with the, the rest of the campaigning that she did and all the work that was going around, but importantly that she was able to really clearly and uh, succinctly describe just how bad this was, led to the sort of transformational change that transformed healthcare in the UK. Um, and it's with that kind of spirit that we uh, have the Helix Centre, which is a design studio set up at St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. Um, it's a glass and wood box that literally is plonked right in the middle of the hospital where people think it's either a spa or an MRI scanner, um, which it is next to. But uh, we are a collaboration between Imperial College London and the, the Royal College of Art. 
and we were set up really just to, to, to see how design could be, in, when it's embedded in the clinical environment, could really transform healthcare. And we are designers, we're technologists, but we're also clinicians and we're academics. So I work with nurses, physios, uh, surgeons, oncologists, and we work with the patients and the public and the frontline staff. And we have a whole bunch of different projects. We work with pediatric drug safety, uh, stroke rehabilitation, but for myself and for the Helix, we have a large number of end of life care projects. So it's important to sort of show that we don't just do one thing, we do many things. And for that to happen, we have a pretty unique uh, process. Um, I'll describe quite simply. Uh, we kind of combine clinical and academic methodologies where we kind of work with partners and we get grants together and we work through a process of, of work which brings out some academic outputs. But at the same time, we combine with design and technology development. So we'll use design research uh, to, to, to discover uh, and identify problems and work through them and work in parallel with our academics and clinicians to deliver products uh, and do things like clinical trials. And we do that over a number of years. It might be one or two, three years. And it's really in the sort of forward moving focus that we try and try and make some significant change. But with all this kind of like, you know, methodology, for me as a designer, um, the only thing that is important about design is how it relates to people. It's a quote from Victor Papanek, who was a designer in the 1960s. He was a friend of uh, Buckminster Fuller. He kind of pioneered what he called social design. Uh, and for, for me as a designer, we go through and use lots of different things. So um, through our work, we work with many different disciplines, as I said. Um, but importantly, we conduct design research everywhere. So although we're embedded in the hospital, I've been spending the week uh, in a hospice. Uh, we do it in people's homes. We'll just look and conduct research everywhere and we'll collaborate with everyone but really importantly that we design, we prototype, we iterate, and we test, and we make things. So I'm gonna go through a couple of examples, especially in relation to our end of life care work. So when we talk about design research, what we really mean is that we observe people in the real world um, to understand their needs. It's a really key element of what we do with our design uh, research. And the example that uh, uh, I'll use is when we started the end-of-life projects, um, we sat in our environment, which is St. Mary's, and we started speaking to staff, nurses, uh, <coughs> patients, families about the, their experience of end-of-life care, and the, the, the DNA CPR form kept coming up in conversation. And as we kind of did some research and spoke to our, our academics, this was obviously a burning issue. Um, and as a project, it's quite long, but the long and short of it was that we worked with the Resource Council to, to design the new RESPECT plan and process. Um, what's interesting for me, again, as a designer, is uh, we, we went through the whatever it was, 47 iterations of the form to design it with hundreds of almost stakeholders. But for me, the really great thing was this little bar right in the middle of the form, which was really designing in the, the space for someone to understand the difference between sustaining life and prioritizing comfort and where they felt they might sit on that spectrum. Uh, and, and including that as a, as a set of decisions as, that a clinician will make to, to complete the form. Um, this was a large part due to our research where we understood exactly what patients were looking for, what families were looking for, what they needed, but also what clinicians were looking for and what they needed as well. So we, we hope that this sort of uh, design intervention kind of, can help address everyone's needs. Obviously this thing's very iterative, so we'll see how that transforms over time. But what was really important was that we weren't just simply designing the form. We had to think about the education and the training that went along with it. So. We designed the RESPECT uh, training uh, website, which um, would be used for clinicians to understand how the process worked <coughs> and how they could actually learn to have difficult conversations. Uh, and the long and short of it was that from what we learned about design research and observing the real world and this project was that we learned that it was more important to redesign the relationship than it was to actually simply redesign the form. And that was imbued directly from the work that we did right at the start. 
And this really is a key element of what we think about when we think about human-centered design, is understanding the relationships of the people involved, not simply the artifacts or the objects. It's how these things interrelate. And from a second point, we really are keen to design and build and test. And we do that by building prototypes and making things. So we use prototypes as a way to think, uh, and we use them as a way to engage with people, whoever they may be, and to use them to get feedback on the things that we're building. Uh, it's been touched upon early in some other sessions, and it's really, really important, especially when we're thinking about digital things, that this iterative approach is used all the time because you, rather than thinking you're on the right track, you can find out very early that you're on the wrong. So the example I'll use is the um, advanced care, um, oops, um, the advanced care planning platform that we built a prototype for. Um, we know that advanced care plans can be incredibly valuable. They're never really done by that many people for lots of many different reasons. And we built a prototype to see, like, okay, how difficult is this to actually make? And how do people respond to when we use them? And what are the sort of barriers that might stop people from creating one? And so with our expertise as designers, we can do that. We can throw it into the real world and see what people think. And one of the biggest takeaways that we, we learned from building this prototype was that we, used to, we, we first thought that creating an advanced care plan was the thing that you did at the end. But actually, it's the first step. And we really believe that to create an advanced care plan is the first step in living well with an illness. And so we kind of flipped the way in which you'd actually create this plan. And the, the, the learning from these prototypes and speaking to people and getting the feedback meant that the product that we now have, which we've called Amber Plans for now, which will be live next week, um, is a better reflection on how people want to live and how they want to live well with their illness. And it's really a kind of galvanizing and, and, and solidifying the types of philosophies that I know we all kind of believe in into a product that people can use. <coughs> And thirdly, um, there's this issue of collaboration, an issue, the, the idea of collaboration, and this idea that we collaborate with everyone. Um, because we are not clinicians, uh, because we are not uh, assigned to any particular profession apart from design, which is to say we work with everyone and do everything for everyone, it's really important that we have the spirit of uh, harnessing the different people and the different power that people have in their disciplines to try and create radical change. And we do this at the Helix through a number of things. We use workshops, we'll do design sprints where we you know, use the neutral space of a, a design studio to bring in all walks of life, all different disciplines into a different space where they can try and understand the, what might be entrenched thinking of their organization, of their, their profession, of their life to uh, try and see how they can unpick it. And I I'll close with this idea of like, what can design do with all these things, with, with prototyping and, and the spirit of collaboration and the use of research and observation to uh, understand the biggest problem. And I, I've kind of been hearing it over the last couple of days, and I think especially with Cormac, you know, which is a, like really spoke to me, this thing that what can design do? So if we just simply put into context again that before the 19th century, the, the, the priest and the, the, the religious uh, community had all the power when it came to death. You know, with the, their divine gaze, um, they used God as a way of holding the keys to a good death. And that was, a, that was the way it was for a very, very long time. And then after the 19th century, until now really, the, the healthcare professional has had all the power. Um, you know, the healthcare professional looks at us with a clinical gaze, you know, you see us diagnostically, you know, you put us on a pathway you, with care packages, you have all the drugs, all the pain relief, all the life-sustaining abilities. You know, you have all the training and you have all the resources. But in my view, in the 21st century, I believe that everyone should have the power. And I believe that design can help distribute all that training, all that knowledge, all that authority and responsibility to throw, uh, to show that those that are dying and those that are around them, that they have the power to have a good death. So uh, on behalf of designers and especially for the Helix, I'd like to ask you that you work with us to, to help give the power back 
to the dying person, to those that are important with them, by using design in small and large ways. Um, I think this is really important because it, it comes down to, uh, as Kurt Vonga says, we're all, here, uh, we're all here to help each other get through this thing, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you, Ivor. That's given me a great place to start. So what I'm going to do um, is just wait for my first slide to come up. Um, that work? No. So I'm Barbara Gale. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what it's like for a hospice to embrace service design and what that means for our staff and volunteers and for patients and families. Just wait for a short pause. It's lovely, isn't it, when technology works? So um, I'm going to start by saying, why did we... Yeah. There we are. So why did we need to do this? Well, I think in the last few days, it's been pretty obvious that we need to change. Um, we know that demand's growing. We know that our staff look like that. I feel like that sometimes, trying to spin all those plates. Um, and if we say to people, right, well, you we could just add a bit of community engagement, go out and work with people in the community, that's going to be fine, isn't it? And they go, and how are we going to do that? Um, you've then got your fundraising team coming up to you and saying, about raising all this money, you know the NHS has dropped your income by 20%. Do you really think I'm going to be able to cover that? And next year is going to be a, a bad year for legacies because we've got nothing in the pipeline. So we're having to do more with less money. And I think it's really important that we try and remember um, that we are giving an amazing service to a few, but actually very few people get it. You know, we are all going to die. There's a 100% mortality rate, but not everybody gets a good experience. And I think that's really important. And that's why we need to change. So the trustees and the directors, and together with the staff and looking at strategy, we decided that we actually didn't just want to keep adding on, and we had added on. We'd added on hospice neighbours, we'd added on an outreach hub, we'd made our staff work more flexibly. Um, you know, we've been doing some amazing work with Open House. But actually, that really hadn't saved us any money, which we needed to do because of a deficit budget. So we wanted to actually look at the whole model, to have a, a, a new model within a lower cost base that would influence the experiences of more people um, and, and to tackle that early engagement that we heard about from Mike Bennett this morning is we know the earlier that we have contact with people, the better experience they have and hopefully the better death and the better bereavement. Um, and we also know we've got to change attitudes to death and dying so that people talk about it more. And I feel really strongly we have to go back to our roots about being a movement about social change that helps put dying back into the hands of people in the community. So what did we do? Well, I got interested in service design. I'd heard a lot about it. We went through a tender process. Um, and I, I loved it because it, it went back to what was important to people, what was important to them, not what we thought was important for them. And I think in, in the hospice world, we've been, we've been having great ideas for 50 years now, haven't we? Absolutely brilliant. But do we really know now that the ideas that we're having are the right ones? So we made contact um, and live work uh, won the tender process. And they're just going to say a little bit about what it's like to work with us. No, they're not. Mm. Can I have some help and run the video, please? It's lovely when it works before, but it doesn't work now. Thank you. Most of my design background has been in healthcare, so it's a space that I have felt quite comfortable in. Um, what's been challenging about this one is sort of the weightiness and the emotional intensity of the project. So sometimes it's been really funny and really light and really open. Um, sometimes, particularly after the first workshop, when we heard a lot of stories for the first time and after, you know, the first days of interviewing, uh, really just heavy, heavy, heavy when you go home and it's, um, that's when you sort of feel the weight and the importance of the work that you're doing. And well, I think 
uh, service design in particular has um, a holistic quality to it. So rather than just saying, you know, we'll sort of approach from one angle, you know, we like to um, think about sort of service design isn't the bricks, it's the mortar in between them. It's the thing that connects all these different pieces. And hospice is very much the same way. Hospice isn't just, you know, one service, it's a whole system of services. So understanding it, you know, starting from a place of empathy and trying to understand people where they are and not making assumptions about it, you know, people in hospices need to do that and designers need to do it as well. But then also being able to to work in the moment and be flexible and react to the situation. Both of these, you know, groups have the same sort of skill sets there. So um, our process of, you know, starting with interviews and starting with trying to, to just talk to people and just hear their stories and then building ideas that are based purely on what we've been told and not just, you know, I think this is cool. Um, and then going through and, and, you know, and testing it and being quite rigorous about that. And then, you know, this willingness to experiment, you know, with, with a hospice journey, there's no way to predict actually, you know, what's going to happen along the way. We, we learned that with the journey planning, that there is no path. You can say, check, check, check. Um, and it's very much the same thing for a service design. You always have to adapt. You always have to uh, learn as you go and, and, you know, sort of um, expand and contract as you need to. So what was really important when we started work with LiveWork is that they weren't, we weren't going to give them the baby, they were going to go off and wash it and dress it and give it back to us. They were going to do this work with us and they were going to equip us with skills that would stay with us. Um, and it was really important that our staff were involved in the whole process right from the beginning. Um, so far to date, we've had 72 staff and volunteers involved in workshops and <coughs> interviewing. Um, we've really had a big focus on communication. Um, we've had leaflets, flyers, posters. It's been all over on our website, on our Facebook page. Um, we, it's not me standing up and talking to staff about it. I involve staff who've been interviewing people who are ill and their families, and they've been talking about what they've learned. And actually, it's already changing practice. Even though this service design process that we're going through is a marathon, not a sprint. And I would say we've put the shoes on, the kit on, and we've just left the running blocks. Um, but it is going to take longer. But actually having staff involved in the process is so important. So um, as I've talked about, you know, there's a, there is a process you go through. I have to be honest, it's like walking in the dark with somebody who's got the torch and the map and you don't know quite where you're going. <laughs> So they know the process, we know the content, and it is a bit like they're leading us. Um, and what you do is you do one phase and you think you've got to grips with it, and that helps you go into the next phase and then so on. But it is step by step, and you're always learning, you're always developing, and we're calling it to our team that we're going to listen, learn, and adapt. And this isn't something that's going to stop. We will end up with a, a more cohesive model but we will carry on. Somebody said to my clinical doctor, so when will it finish? And she went, never. We're going to have to carry on doing this all the time that we're working. So um, just a little bit about the process. For the first workshop, we had frontline staff. Then we had senior staff to come together to sort of synthesize and bring things together. Then we trained 20 staff to go out and interview 27 people. From that, from the interviews, we then had to synthesize. Um, we then developed ideas and concepts. We refined them. And now we're starting in the testing. But the most important piece were the interviews. And they were with people who didn't just know the hospice. We were really, um, it was crucial to us that we did meet some people who'd used hospice care. But we also wanted to meet people in care homes who'd had relatives die in the hospital, who'd had relatives die in care home, who'd looked after people with dementia. And we didn't say, what did you think of hospice care? Because some of them would have said, you're marvelous. Others would have said, what do you do? Um, and you would have had that bit in between. We asked them to tell their stories and experiences of living with illness, being with death, and, and living with bereavement. And this is one of the stories from Anne. Knowing that my husband could have his medication and not be in pain, Nobody should suffer. We waited four hours for some pain relief for him. And my husband had, had hardly had any, up to, and this was on the day he was dying. Um, and that was awful to see him struggling. So that was, for you on that last day, it was specifically pain, pain relief. relief. Yeah. And of course, 
everything's through the um, it's injectable and that's so it has to be a district nurse to, to come out and we were told it's extremely busy it's a bank holiday well that's not really very helpful when you're watching somebody suffer and, and you wouldn't allow an animal to suffer like that and I think four hours or any amount of hours I think it's just too long I think that's the, the, the time you need it most and I think that's the time you get the least support if if you'd known how to um, work the syringe I'd have driver, done it in a second. If, if you'd have been trained? I would have given him his medication in a millisecond. So what was interesting as we heard the stories and, the, and what was coming out, I don't think we were hearing anything that we didn't already know, and, and that's not just the point, which I'll talk about later, but it was really validating what we knew and hearing that from people who had been living through this. We heard things from a gentleman who had a wife called Ruth who used to be a healthcare assistant, and he went, how do people manage without a Ruth? She knows the system, she knows what to do, she knows who to ring. Um, you know, we heard issues about out-of-hours services. Um, we heard that people didn't feel prepared or informed of what was going to happen to them um, and we also heard things like somebody said the second death is easier because you know what's going on well why can't we make the first death better and this links with ideas that they're talking about in Australia by Clary Noonan about death literacy where people learn to have a better understanding and knowledge and skills about death so out of all the interviews we then synthesized now you did see probably in some of Ivor's uh, slides there are a lot of post-its when you do this <laughs> Um, in fact, I think you were taking shares out in the post-it company, um, and the picture in the middle of Debbie and Lizma, you know, is what get, when it all goes wrong. Um, but it is about you use them to bring the themes and the ideas together. So that's really important. But when we were looking at solutions, we had three criteria when we're looking at ideas. It's got to meet the needs that people told us about. We've got to be able to afford it, and it's got to meet our strategy of reaching more people. And we've got to have the capability and the infrastructure and the resources to be able to do it. So we've now started looking at the concepts that came out. And this good start idea is really important. And again, nothing new. But what's going to be new is how we test it. So one of the ideas we're testing at the moment is something called meaningful moments. And again, um, um, that was something that's been talked about. Joan Bakewell talked about it before. But actually... Um, these are really important things to people that actually make those last months, that time where they create new memories. And you're going to say, well, we do that already. Well, we might do it with a few people, but how are we going to enable more people to do it? So when we do the testing, I do think um, Russell Cormack actually looked at, Cormack Russell actually looked at my slide because one of the things we ask people is um, when we're going through an idea, we say, well, is that something I could do myself? Could you do it with me or do it for me? And most people, when we're looking at solutions, want things that they can do themselves. They don't necessarily want people to come in and do them for them. So at the moment, we're creating some puzzle pieces. I'm not quite sure how they're going to fit together. Um, we know it's about dignity, we know it's about being informed and enabled, and we know it's about networks of support in the community. But this isn't something that's going to happen overnight. This isn't going to be where we're going to turn the old service off and turn the new service on. This is going to be a transformation, how we evolve and develop. We're going to be doing more testing. We hope to run a pilot next autumn. We need to get the infrastructure, IT, and everything supporting it like that. And then we would really like to attach some research to it. So that's been our journey so far. I think we've got a lot of hills and roads ahead of us. Um, but it is being fascinating. And it's just such a joy to do something where you are creating things with your community. Thank you. Amazing. Slides there straight away. Thank you. Um, 
Good afternoon and thank you so much for sticking with us to be in the last session of a three-day conference with people still engaged feels miraculous, so thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Gillinson. I lead an organisation called Innovation Unit. Uh, we're a not-for-profit social enterprise and our mission is to create new solutions that enable more people to belong and contribute to thriving societies and to do that in such a way as we're building alliances for change with places and organisations and networks that mean that those solutions can have impact at scale. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about a piece of work that we've been doing in Lambeth and Southwark, where we've been looking at growing new solutions around better endings, better end of life, and trying to do it in such a way that we're building alliances for change so that they can really have impact at scale and not just be another nice idea that may or may not go somewhere. So that's the headline of what I'm going to be talking about today. Better Endings has been a long time uh, in the gestation. So uh, as Heather said, actually, this really began in 2010. Jake Garber, who co-wrote um, Dying for Change with Charlie Leadbeat, is one of our team, and he was really agitating with us that we must do something around end-of-life care if we really care about thriving societies. And so in the end, we persuaded Guys and St Thomas's charity, a fantastic foundation based in Lambeth and Southwark, who are all about creating better and physical, better physical and mental health in those boroughs, to fund a one-year piece of work to explore what better endings would look like in a place. And I have to say, conference organisers, hats off. We've talked a bit about uh, better endings in a clinical context, uh, in a hospice context. And here we were actually really starting to look at something in the context of a whole place and how some of those different elements might, in fact, come together. I get the sense that the case for change for all of this has been rehearsed substantially over the past few days, so I am not going to dwell. I will whiz through. But the point about doing something in a place was this notion that everybody deserves great support for themselves and their families at the end of life. And actually, our feeling was that if that's really your aim... You can't be looking at the question of how a particular service or a particular intervention might change. Actually, you need to be looking at a place and a whole cohort of people to ask how all of the resources that surround them might come together to enable them and many, many more people to have a better end. This was all reinforced by qualitative research that we did. Again, I suspect you know these stories over and over again, but speaking with lots of people within that borough, the stories that emerged about the, um, the last years, months, days of life being actually fraught with concern and worry um, and simply not being enjoyable in any way were the stories that emerged. And again, I won't talk in detail about the data, but the quantitative data, as we know, suggests that actually we have to look at this problem holistically. 54% of complaints coming to the NHS being around end-of-life care. This is not a niche issue. It's something that has to be looked at holistically. So... If we were going to do that, and we were going to do it in a place, what was it that we were actually going to do about it? And you've already heard quite a lot about different aspects of this, which frankly I won't dwell on because Barbara and Ivor have talked about it um, incredibly fluently and compellingly. We always knew that in order to get into a sort of transformational space in Southwark and Lambeth, that generating new insights on the challenges that people faced had to be the first thing. And we did a huge amount of that. Interviews and observations with, uh, with people who were dying in their families, with frontline staff, with senior leaders and stakeholders. And of course, in a moment, I'll talk to how we got to the designing new solutions bit. But the thing that I think is distinctive and really critical here is the piece about mobilising contributions. This work was always as much about mobilising a local alliance for change, quite frankly, in whatever shape that people who turned up wanted it to be in, um, because we knew that there was no chance of anything sustainable happening unless we were genuinely generating that momentum. And that, for, I mean, that to me was one of the reasons that uh, Cormac's work resonated so strongly with me this morning, the piece about done by. This was always about creating a space within which people could say, 
we want to do this. We can see this as being the important thing to do. Now help us to do it. And that was exactly what this work was all about. So a teeny bit on process. You've heard masses on process already, I know. Um, so there's a piece about setting the scope. There was a piece which was about generating insights and perspectives through all of the interviews that you described, which culminated in a place in which we agreed what the key insights were and where we had to move from them. Then there was a place which was about ideas development. What kinds of things might we actually be able to do about some of this stuff? There was a process whereby we tested some of those things quickly. Some of them, um, as Ivor's pictures demonstrated, sitting in rooms, playing about with bits of paper, having conversations. Some of them actually out there trying stuff out to refine a list of, in the end, three major propositions that we were actually going to test really substantially, again, with that group of people who said they wanted to make them happen. Um, and that's pretty much where we are at now. And again, the thing that I will say that feels really important to this, and again, Barbara touched on it, is that wherever you see this workshop uh, little icon here, the critical thing that was happening was all of those local people who were a mix of people who were dying and families of people who were dying, frontline practitioners, system leaders, other community members who were simply interested in the issue, um, local faith leaders, etc. These were all points at which that coalition were coming together to say, we understand this research and here are the things we think are most important from it. We now understand or we believe these ideas might be the best ideas for taking it forward. And having tested out these ideas together, these are the ones that we think have got legs. So that mobilizing that coalition of people who were actually going to make the thing happen, happened at every single stage of this process, which was critical. And over 200 people were engaged in this process in Southwark and Lambeth throughout it. So... What came from that? And that's, the, that's obviously the, the key question. What actually happened as a result of it? Well, one thing I do want to say, and this is, this is where I think some of the insights and some of the solutions are skewed, slightly skewed, um, is that all of the key insights, of course, emerged from the group who most wanted to participate in answering this question and who could participate. And actually, that group was really dominated by community participants of various kinds, people uh, leading not-for-profits working in this area, community centres, faith leaders, people who are interested, and honestly, not so many clinicians around the table. So I don't think you will therefore be surprised to hear that a lot of the insights sit in the space around how might we supplement some of the clinical experience that people receive right now, rather than necessarily being in the how do we transform it space. And they were these, and again, themes that have been touched on over and over again. But for me, the big message from all of this is that from all of those interviews, from all of that processing together, people were saying that they wanted to death to be much more like what life was all about for them, all about contribution and meaning and purpose. And for them, that meant remaining socially connected, retaining independence and control, continuing to contribute, wherever they were at in their lives, being remembered and leaving a legacy, and having great support for their loved ones, not just being supported, but still making sure that those they cared about too were supported as well. So those were the critical insights that came out over and over again, and the things that we then were committed to helping that group to actually bring to life. So... There were four questions then that that made us really specifically try and answer. One, how might we respond better to people's social and emotional needs at the end of life? Second, what new and different things might happen in the health and social care system, but also in the interface between the health and social care system and things that happen outside it? Thirdly, how might we encourage more different kinds of support around that clinical and care system to come into being? And finally, how might people access some of that? How do they come across it and how do they trust it? So those were some of the questions that emerged there. Now, again, because this was always about trying to generate action out of this rather than simply come up with ideas that looked lovely on a piece of paper, 
The places that we went, therefore, were the places where there was a combination of things in play. One was clearly new ideas had to tackle those questions and had to respond to the insights that we had revealed. Of course they did. They also had to fire up the people in the room. <laughs> the people who were there had to be convinced by them that they had half a chance of working. And thirdly, within the group that we had mobilised, there had to actually be the asset, the resource, the leadership to make any of it happen. There was no magic other place in which it could happen. So it was only that coalition who could do it. So all of these solutions were things that both felt pertinent to what we'd learned, people, were people in the room were excited by, and that people in the room could actually do something about. And so that's what these represent. And really interestingly, it means that all of them are in this, in well, two of the three are in this interface between how is it that professionals can enable communities to do something meaningfully at scale to support people who are dying in their families. Um, and one of them, the last one, Ripples, is, is actually about entirely outside that system. How might we do something to help people have a greater legacy in their lives? So there's a, there's a, there's a really interesting theme, I think, in there, which is both about liberating that community contribution, but recognising that in order for it to become really meaningful and impactful at scale, there's got to be some engagement with the system as it stands, or it risks just sitting quietly by itself in a corner, which was never what anybody wanted. So there were three things. Number one was this notion of neighbourhood care, which was basically about building a volunteer network of people who could be available to those who were dying and who were isolated who would be referred, or rather those people would be referred to this service by their GP or by community nurses. There had to be a place where people were actually being met. And secondly, that those volunteers would be supported. They would have some degree of training to understand what it would take to really meaningfully support people in that moment. So absolutely, the people, you know, people in the community themselves saying, I want to help, I want to contribute, but with the support required and with the referrals required, frankly, to get them into the right place at the right time. The second is this notion of coach for care, which uh, responds directly to that insight around people who are dying really want to make sure that their loved ones are cared for too. And this is this notion that we've got this vast army out there of people who've got lived experience of caring for people who are dying and who want to do something with that, but who, again, need the sort of access and support in order to make that happen. So Coach for Care attempts to mobilise this sort of latent army of people with lived experience and to give them the support and the training required to be a brilliant coach and to help those people who are caring for their loved ones, both to reflect and make sense of their own experiences, which in and of itself is huge, but also to help them to manage some of the practical things that are so hard in those moments. How is it that I can make good choices about my own work and employment? How can I make good choices about my relationships, my mental health, all of those sorts of things at the same time? So again, interface between those two things. And then finally, ripples. Sorry, I should have been going through some of these more detailed things as I was talking, dear me. Uh, then finally, ripples comes from this lovely notion within Buddhism that uh, in life we're like, we're like a sort of pebble being dropped in some water and that actually what happens is that those ripples keep just kind of moving out beyond us when we die and that our impact in small and big ways continues to affect others. Now, ripples is targeted at those people who are entirely isolated, really in their lives and in their deaths and for whom the notion of legacy is a really difficult one to sort of get their heads around because actually who is the legacy with and ripples is this notion that we might train people who are working with connected with those really isolated people people in homeless shelters suffering from drug and alcohol addiction to support those people to reflect on their lives, to make meaning from them, and to create products, collateral stuff that can help them to really believe that it all meant something. Now, in all three of those, within Southwark and Lambeth, where, as we've said, we've spent the vast majority of our kind of time and effort, if you like, building a coalition of people who actually want this stuff to happen there are places where this is now starting to live, which is really exciting. So um, 
around neighbourhood care. We're exploring the notion that housing associations, for example, might host, or I'm trying to think of how Cormac would put it, um, be guests in this programme, um, uh, such that it can live on. There needs to be somewhere where this is housed and facilitated and supported. So that begins to be exciting in Southwark and Lambeth. St Christopher's, fantastically, through Heather, are exploring how they might adapt, that take on Coach for Care and host Coach for Care. And various local charities are thinking about, uh, sorry, Groundswell, St Mungo's and others, are thinking about how they might take on this Ripples model to work with their cohorts. So in one sense, okay, there's exciting stuff going on in Southwark and Lambeth, but I don't actually want, want the sort of, the thing that we leave with here to be, Okay, lovely, fantastic job done, because I think there are at least two levels of really serious challenge in here, as well as opportunity raised by all of this. I just want to talk about that a teeny bit further. So, on one level, great, it's happening in Southwark and Lambeth. On another, I just want to come back to this point about where the majority of people are ending their lives at the moment. Now, I think that all of these ideas are fantastic and powerful and clearly they are going to influence some people's lives. But at the moment, those things risk being in a supplementary space. They risk being an add-on to a system that isn't working well enough and that are simply improving things around the edges because it is not working. There is a challenge in there, even within Lambeth, that actually some of those insights around what people want at the end of life are not infiltrating they're not infecting, they're not changing the mainstream system as it stands in, uh, in the clinical sense or in the care sense. So there's a, there's a big challenge, I think, in there for us. We may be mobilising new assets, but we're not mobilising the old ones. And whilst that's still true, the impact of this has to be limited. So that's number one. Number two is the issue of, and I will unashamedly call it scale-up, um, here, which is fantastic that this can have impact in Labath and Southwark, but actually there are ideas here, there are insights here, and there's actually a process here which feels like it has real resonance well beyond Lambeth and Southwark too. So on that basis, I guess there are three challenges um, that I want to land with you here today. One is, how might we get this process to be more widely adopted? Where do the opportunities exist, where there's hunger in other places to ask this question? In our whole place, how could we better mobilize all of our resources to ensure that many more people have, an end, have a good end to their lives? Because there's something in here which combines insight, design, mobilization, that could be the thing like La Leche League that proliferates, the process that proliferates. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is, I think there are some nuggets of really interesting ideas here which clearly won't be taken wholesale from one place to another, neighborhood care, coach for care, etc. But adapted for other contexts might be really powerful. Is that one of your contexts? Where else might it happen? And then thirdly, and I do think this is the biggest one, where are there opportunities for some of these insights to infect the whole system, such that we are not just in this supplementing space, liberating new resource to help make the situation better, but where are the places and where is the appetite where actually all of the resources, old and new, might come together better to realise this vision where end of life is much more like what it is that people want throughout their whole lives. So those are the challenges that uh, I leave you with um, and look forward, I hope, to Q&A later. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Well, I thought I was going to have an easier time being at the end um, because um, I would, all I would have to do is not repeat anything. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, um, they, and they have said most things, I'm, so I'm not going to disagree with anything that you've heard so far. What strikes me about this whole subject is that... Um, it's an idea that time has arrived. Lots of different people 
have come to the conclusion that a different kind of process is required to improve what we do day to day in the health service. And I first came across this uh, idea back in um, many years ago, 10 years ago now, when, the, when Sheffield Hallam University's art school were helping Sheffield teaching hospitals uh, do some design work in their outpatient department, not only in the physical space, but also in the processes that we were using. And so I've always thought this might help us uh, with our problem we have today. I'm going to talk to you about the Marie Curie Design to Care program, which uh, I was very keen to, to um, promote within Marie Curie, because I've always had a fundamental uh, belief in creative design as a process. Uh, and the reason is that, that I live with three artists, and I have no choice but to agree with them most of the time. So, the question that we asked ourselves in Marie Curie is, how can we meet the growing need and increasingly uh, growing needs of increasingly complex uh, palliative care patients in the UK's aging population in the years to come. So this is a familiar problem now. We're all talking about it. Just to remind you, what could be the alternative to this? Because actually I find it such a pressing need that, that actually the horrors of what might come along if we don't do it are at the top of my mind. We know, as you've probably heard already in the conference, that the need for palliative care will go up by about 42% by the year 2040. And the alternative seemed to me to be almost with us, dying on A&E trolleys. A movement maybe back to the 1950s, my guru, Eric Wilkes, identified the need for palliative care as the hospice movement was starting. And he was founding a, a hospice in Sheffield by doing a survey of dying in Sheffield. He just, in those days, you didn't get to hospital if you were dying. If, if all the doctors agreed you were dying, they didn't admit you. So you, you were looked after at home. And the skill set of those of you, of, of people looking after you at home was very mixed. And whereas my guru, Eric, could admit patients to the cottage hospital in a nice Derbyshire village for an end which was not dissimilar from a hospice death now, um, his colleagues back in uh, the city of Sheffield had nowhere to send them. And then, of course, there's a spectre of assisted suicide as well, which might be the, the viable alternative to getting this job right. So, one thing I'd, I'd like to contribute to this, this talk is to help those of you that have never come across design ideas, or maybe those of you that aren't researchers, understand the difference between those two things and what the way we seem to have arrived at healthcare design at the moment. Can I have a quick show of hands, please? All, everybody with a clinical role, put your hand up. Thank you. Everyone with a managerial or leader's role, put your hand up. Thank you. Everybody with a research role, put your hand up. Thank you. Okay, so a little history lesson. Care pathways didn't come from nowhere. Care pathways came from an analysis of how we work, which was initially called the business process. And um, this piece by Adam Smith, the, the thinker, was, uh, is sometimes quoted as, as, as the first, one of the first examples of somebody observing work and describing it as a process. So, uh, I won't read it out because I'm very bad at reading out loud. But um, as you can see, it's a description of a process where different bits of it are done by different people or by maybe the same person one after the other. A task is split into processes and the processes follow a linear path. And each time that happens, then the quality of the work inside that process affects the whole thing. And that's really what, where Toyota came in. So they developed, uh, uh, in the 50s and 60s, this Toyota production system. And the great contribution that that factory made was to focus on quality and how those individual processes could be improved by the people who had the ideas and they were the people that were doing those processes. So everyone that worked on a, on a production line 
helped to improve their bit of it. And the, the, the problem of the, of the difficult engine, the, the, the engine that has gone wrong, where did it go wrong in that process, was something that got looked at and analysed. And that has been, fundamentally, the thinking that has informed where we, our care pathways. And care pathways became very popular in the health service. And that's how we got the kind of thinking that we've got now. So most of the, the major um, he, um, business consultancy firms will actually have that sort of process in mind when they come to look at what you're doing and trying to improve it. We asked ourselves, what elements of creative synthesis and scientific analysis are needed to produce a plan that's likely to handle this big problem that we've got? What can we, what can we do differently from that sort of thinking? How can we... We all know from all the research that's been done in palliative care, although God knows it hasn't been that much, uh, we all know that there are lots of bits of stuff that could make things better, but how do we put them together, and how will we know whether it works or not? Well, you've already seen uh, versions of this basic design process. And for those of you that haven't uh, spent much time with designers, the thing that strikes you when you first see how they work is that they don't take stuff for granted. So when they're given a problem, rather than saying, oh, that's the question, we'll answer that, they try and understand the problem. And that understanding increases their, their, their knowledge about what goes on. And then they're defining the difficulty that they need to put right. And then they explore the, the, the possibilities for putting that right. And then they come down and make something that's doable. That's the fundamental difference between somebody, between, I believe, between a designer who can also think about which bits of the process make other bits better, which bits get in the way, which bits never work anyway. So that's, I think that's the difference. Research is different. Um, I often talk in, in uh, other contexts about how research is done, but essentially research is a process where theory and data are brought together to, acquire, to um, acquire knowledge. So what I believe that whatever we do in the design space has to be also tested in a way that teaches us about what works and what doesn't work. In, back in my um, academic days, we used to say that good ideas were to a penny. The difficult bit is making them work and knowing whether they really work in, it, it, every time they need to. So, the, so we aim to transform the future of palliative care. It's a big, ambitious project. It doesn't trump anything from what we've, what we've heard about today. What we're trying to do, because we're a, national, we're a national charity, we're trying to bring together the ideas that are swilling around around uh, design, and we're trying to create something which is recognizably uh, reliable when it comes to doing design in, your, in, in geographic spaces. We're using a lot of disciplines for this project. It's a, the first part of it is a two-year design project, and then we'll be spending at least three years on piloting it and testing. So in this two years, we've got all sorts of people come together working on it. Public health researchers, service users, GPs, healthcare researchers, economists, all of these people. We've actually commissioned Sheffield Hallam University, who have a unit, Lab for Living, which is not dissimilar from Helix. Certainly, they seem to use as many post-its, and, and they seem to think in a very similar way. We're also... Uh, um, working with the University of Cambridge's systems engineers who, um, are, who think of design in a slightly different way, not very differently, but they also think about what the system is that, that the design is happening within. So everything you do in healthcare has a knock-on effect somewhere. And we're trying to bring all of that 
uh, stuff together. We're also trying to make, to, to understand what these sort of inter interventions might mean for commissioners and other healthcare, and healthcare providers in a particular community. So we're, we're trying to broaden the horizon when it comes to uh, what a good uh, toolkit might be. And we're talking about a toolkit because we're talking about a set of, of, of concepts, a, a set of procedures, of protocols that might assist healthcare providers and commissioners in, in a locality do this kind of work. So we have uh, advice from all sorts of, uh, all sorts of people. And we're employing different sorts of thinking. We're thinking about the people and the, the impact on, on, um, on them when we do things differently. We're thinking about how the system changes. We think in the design way, but also we're thinking about risk. And these systems uh, engineers are the sort of people that design cars that work rather than the first version of a piece of software that you've noticed doesn't work very well. You know that there are, you know, there are different kinds of, of engineers. We don't think there's too much scope for producing something that's going to fail straight off the blocks. So we're essentially building in processes where we're stress testing and, and using, uh, uh, as we've heard before, protocols, uh, prototypes to um, try and understand what works and what doesn't. It's a systems-wide approach, so um, it goes beyond the immediate, the immediate uh, healthcare system. Essentially, we're looking at a toolkit. We're looking at a number of interventions which might be put together depending on the locality, depending on what's required in the, in the population we're thinking about. And the tools are things you will have heard of, I hope. So, First of all, we need a receptive clinical commissioning group who are capable of managing the funds and, and changing services. We need civic and institutional support for non-health service community projects, as, in, as is in happening in the compassionate community movement. Uh, I'm thinking of Lancaster. Um, we've, uh, we're very aware of Julian Abel's really interesting, very new work, which might have a big impact on the amount of acute medical admissions that happen. And I'm thinking there about the Frome General Practice Project, where the community intervention enhances the support for carers from within the community. Last couple of minutes, Bill. Thank you. Um, we're looking at uh, an e-shift pilot. This is a, a fascinating piece of IT, which is capable of allowing a registered nurse to control healthcare assistance at great distance, um, it, thereby we are increasing the productivity of both the registered nurse and the healthcare assistants who are also trained in administering medications and doing things that they wouldn't be able to do if they weren't being constantly um, directed by a qualified nurse. We're talking about specialist nurses and therapists capable of visiting people in the home, as in Midhurst. We're, and we're also talking about an intensive home care nursing service, which is very similar to our Marie Curie nursing service to give hands-on care where this is required. Finally, the, the community pharmacy provision needs to be in as is in many places throughout the UK. Inpatient palliative care beds probably as a backup, but 24-7 uh, contributions of specialist care to hospitals will be required, probably. And palliative care outpatient clinics and, uh, in hospitals and hospices to enable this, this sort of care to go upstream to establish relationships very early on. One thing that's come out to me from the kind of processes you've been hearing about is that when you're involved in this kind of design, the, the whole concept of change fatigue just melts away. I mean, if you're on a production line and you're told, you know, this is the way you're going to do it tomorrow because you can forget about how you did it yesterday, and, and that happens several times, you might get a bit of change fatigue. But when you're closely involved with how to make things better and you're responding to your patient's views, the change is exciting. 
And I don't know anybody that's been involved in this sort of process who isn't very enthusiastic about it. So finally, who do you know with 3.5 million <laughs> to pilot our Marie Curie Design Care Toolkit on four sites between 2019 and 2021? So if you, if you do, I'd like to see you afterwards, please. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you very much uh, for four uh, terrific uh, presentations. So we've got a few moments now, uh, a good uh, five or so minutes for some questions and for some discussion. Uh, and I'd urge you not to miss the opportunity. Uh, so while you're getting ready, uh, are there any questions from one of the um, speakers to another, just to get the conversation going? One, one thing I'd like to sort of I come across is that um, most people who talk about this stuff uh, kind of talk about it as though it's really, really new. And what I don't think we've quite got is a sort of community of practice yet. Um, I became particularly uh, keen on establishing that because as we, we have an open call for uh, research in palliative care. And what we've noticed over the years is that the quality of research of evaluate when we're evaluating interventions has gone up and up and up. It's much more reliable than it's ever been. We're much better at that. But what we haven't done is actually got the expertise in designing the intervention on test within the research community yet. Um, I think the other thing we have to do is not just evaluate the intervention in relation to the outcomes for people, it's the cost. And I, I noticed when I looked around all the posters, there were some amazing schemes and amazing projects. I hardly saw anything about what they cost. Mm. And the, in this financial time, with the challenges that we face, what we've got to do has got to be affordable for now and in the future. And I think those are the, when we're doing the design, that's the bit that has to be crucial for us. Absolutely right. Thank you. We've got a question at the back from number three. Do you mind saying uh, who you are and where you're from? Um, I'm Natasha. I'm a PhD student at the University of Liverpool. And I just jumped up then with what is it Barbara was saying about costs. Um, I've been trying to look at approaching uh, sort of daycare centres um, with an economic evaluation. And it's, it's really in its infancy even working out how to approach that. And I just, I almost think that some of these design um, thinking approaches might be necessary to just uh, sort of extend economic evaluation because it's so unclear what scope to even look at. Is it just the patients? Is it just the hospital down the road? Is it the carers and their employers as well? Um, and it's, it just, just want to say that that's sort of an area that really needs some creative thinking, I think. Do any of you want to do Yes, I, I, absolutely. I, I think what, we've, what we're learning as we're doing this process is we mustn't jump to the solutions that we're used to. Mm. Uh, we've got to spend some creative time thinking about new ideas and then go back to, with people and test them and then prototype them and get them to help develop ideas with us. But we've got to have a business costings model alongside it so that we can judge it. And some things may be more expensive, but hopefully some things will be less. Yeah. Um, and I think hospices aren't particularly good at knowing what we're spending on what. Yeah. Sarah? Yeah, just a cu couple of things to add to that. I mean, clearly in all of our work, whether it's in end-of-life care or tackling mental health differently or whatever, the question of how can solutions be different and better and lower cost is critical across the piece. Um, and our experience is that this is where the multidisciplinarity piece is critical. Yeah. Because actually, the economic piece is not, is not a design question at all. Um, it, I don't think other may want to debate it. But um, in our experience, it needs at least three different groups of people to be working together. On one hand, you need the people who are actually designing the solution, who deeply understand what it's going to take to make something happen. You need people who are experts in the system as it stands, who understand the financial flows, what the incentives are, who's going to lose out if people stop using certain services and do other things, etc., etc. And the third thing you need is then some really 
hardcore economic modeling expertise to help you to figure out the alternative. And it's in the collaboration between those three things that you end up with a solution that is both workable, but is also incentivized and can generate the sort of economic outcomes that's required too. So that, that for me is where the answer lies. Helpful. Kathleen, did you have a question? I did. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Kathleen Caper. I'm Head of Policy and Advocacy at Hospice UK. Um, I was really taken, Barbara, by your comments on a, about we need to stop just adding on yes. in response to increased demand. Um, and that got me thinking, how can we take design thinking to help us stop doing some of the things that we do? Because we can't keep adding on. We need to do some new things in order to meet demand to make sure we give everybody access to palliative and end-of-life care. But it does essentially mean stopping doing some things too. I, I think it will. Um, but I think by using design thinking and the process, we will also over the next year be looking at home care, admissions, how we support people in hospitals. That's still where most people die. So all the principles and ideas that are coming out, we will then be working with our partners to see how we might implement those ideas in different settings. And then by having a costings model alongside that, we can start to see what the options and the ideas are. And, you know, we're, we're going to have to make some choices in the future. I don't think there just isn't enough money around to carry on doing what we're doing. Um, so I, I think we, you can apply design thinking to everything that we do. Just Bill? Yeah, I think we've got a particular problem in, in particularly end-of-life care because... If we make an intervention which then reduces the cost in the health service of end-of-life care, and I, I mean, there are ones around. The E-Shift thing I mentioned does that. Midhurst does that. The problem is that the savings that are made are diffusely spread throughout the health service. And every, everywhere, you know, every ward in a hospital will benefit a little bit, and so will some GPs and so, and so forth. But nobody really will benefit very much and probably not enough to make any savings. That's the problem we've got. And I think maybe that actually there might be a design solution to a funding model which allows this to happen. I don't, I'm very concerned that the current funding models that we have will ever allow any money to be transferred over to palliative care in order to save that money elsewhere in the health service. Something has to change there. Ivor, would you like to make any comment? I'm thinking that you're working in a context mm -hmm. which is uh, constantly looking at uh, health changes, health innovation, hugely finite resources. Mm -hmm. uh, any insights from your perspective? I mean, uh, so although we're based in Imperial College, the, the world I kind of exist in is one of, you know, health tech startups and all these sorts of things. And, there's a compelling argument you know, that's always made every health tech company in the world has a slide, or at least in, especially in the UK, has a slide about how they'll save the NHS one billion pounds. Mm -hmm. It's the same number every single time. And it's exactly that point of like, but who's getting that money in, in what way? And it's kind of, there's, a, there's I, I don't want to be the sort of, uh, the poor poor of my own discipline, but there's a danger when des design becomes the, panacea of all your problems because it there's a there's a there's a I love the the process thing that you said about Toyota because it's like I don't want design thinking to be tacked onto the end of that no. um so just to sort of <laughs> caution a little bit that there's if if anything that I take away from all this is that it's iterative it needs to change so you may find that you'll get to a certain state and you'll have to kind of chuck it out and start again I think you know your your process is uh, Barbara is really great because it is that sort of it's never really going to end and it's going to transform. So um, the 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 compelling argument of you know and we do it a little bit and I try to push back is that it's the promise of technology as well. So even I see it with funding calls. You know, yeah, the the budget that Bill has, you know, it's incredible. There's a whole load of money for technology. You know, like machine learning and AR and VR and all this kind of stuff that's floating around in the NHS. 
And it's crazy because if you can just say that, well, we use uh, augmented reality to solve mental health problems. I, I, what, how does that work? So there's a real danger that we kind of throw technology at it, we throw design at it, and we'll, that'll somehow solve the problem. I really think that, and this is what I'm learning my research for this project, is it's about the people. And so how do you enable the people to do it themselves? Lovely. We're going to finish there. Um, Barbara, when can we expect to hear something more from St. Nicholas? Um, I think next, or, well, to be honest, this is a process. Okay. Um, we try and keep our website up to date. If anybody's interested, please do contact me. Um, we'll keep our website up to date. But I think the, the thing we're aiming for is to actually have a, a live pilot in a, a geographical area. Um, next autumn. Lovely. And from Innovation Unit, there's an event on the 11th of December uh, in South East London. If anybody's interested to come and be part of it, it's free, it's in the morning, uh, it should be interesting. But for now, please join me in thanking our speakers very much indeed.